welcome this Monday Thursday. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. In this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil. All that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. We are called to cleanse our hearts and prepare for the joy of the Paschal Feast of Easter. We are called to be servants of God and one another, following the example of Jesus, who washed the feet of his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. And we are called to participate in the unity of Christ's church, receiving the precious gifts of his body and blood in the Eucharistic meal, a foretaste of the feast to come, the culmination of our reconciliation with God and one another. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. In the words of absolution, we receive forgiveness as if from God himself. On this holy day, let us make confession to God and one another so that we may enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and one another. Let us now confess our sin. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of his holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment upon our hearts and give us all the will to serve others as he was servant of all. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now a reading from Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Today is Monday, Thursday. This special day is often referred to as Holy Thursday or Passion Thursday. The word Monday is derived from the Latin word mandatum, meaning command or commandment. The Monday and Monday Thursday refers to the command Jesus gave to the disciples at the Last Supper, that they should love one another as he loved them. Leonardo da Vinci, the versatile genius of the Renaissance, excelled in many fields. But today he is remembered mostly because of two priceless paintings, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Completed in 1498, the Last Supper was painted on a wall of the dining hall in the Santa Maria della Grazie in Milan, Italy. The actual event didn't look like this, you know. Da Vinci never intended to make his painting a faithful reproduction of the original scene that took place in first century Palestine. But as it might have taken place in 15th century Italy. The room, the table, even the disciples were representations. Da Vinci chose what he considered the most dramatic moment of the Last Supper. That moment, just after the Lord calmly said, One of you, of you will betray me. The meal, the Seder, was a meal built around memory. And during this meal, Jesus asks us to remember as he broke the bread and poured the wine. And yet, this meal of remembrance that is most often associated with this picture is so different from the actual event. But as a background, it will suffice. On the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make a preparation for you to eat the Passover meal? So, he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover meal with my disciples? You a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover meal. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were seated at the table, Jesus said, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. Is it I, Lord? Am I the one? Jesus replied, One of the twelve, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man! It would be better for him if he had not been born. My name is Nathaniel, a fisherman. My friend Philip introduced me to Jesus. I remember that first day. Philip came to me and said he had found the Messiah 
whom Moses and the prophets had written about. I didn't really expect that Philip was right, that the Messiah would come from a little insignificant town like Nazareth. I said to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But Philip insisted. Come and see, he said. When I approached Jesus, I knew, not only in my head, but in my heart. When Jesus saw me, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He honestly knew me. I responded from my heart, You are the Son of God, the King of Israel. He promised to reveal even more to me. No need. He is who he says he is. That is enough. But now, he tells us that one of us is to betray him. How can that be? How can a traitor be numbered among his closest friends? I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I, Lord? My name is Philip. While several of my friends and I were listening to John the Baptizer, Jesus called us to become his disciples. I went to get my friend Nathaniel. Oh, I was overjoyed when Jesus accepted him as a devoted follower. During these few years of close friendship with Jesus, my faith in God has become stronger, uh, deeper. I remember when he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and fish. I asked him, where are we to buy bread that all of these may eat? You should have seen what I witnessed. It takes my breath away when I remember it. There were so many moments like that. Moments blessed by God. I can truly say that he who sees Jesus has seen the Father. But now Jesus shocks us by telling us that there is a betrayer in our midst. Does the betrayer not know that in betraying Jesus, he is also betraying God? Can one be so blind? Who, who can it be? Can it be Philip? I the one? My name is James, but since another in our group bears that familiar name, I am called James the Lesser, being lesser in size than the other James. I guess I prefer James the Younger. I will never forget the day I first saw the master. I was passing the place where John was baptizing. I was curious to see what was going on, so I turned off the road for a closer look. It was then that I saw Jesus asking John to baptize him. After the baptism, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And we actually heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Later, Jesus called me to be one of his disciples. Something moved within me, and I followed him. And since then, I have walked with him, and talked with him, and stayed with him, prayed with him, trying to learn as much about him and his Heavenly Father as I could. But now, one of us is to betray him. Surely the betrayer is out of his mind. Yet, I keep asking myself, Lord, is it I?
I am Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. I am a fisherman, an ordinary average person like one of you. I first followed John the baptizer, and when the baptizer pointed out Jesus like Nathaniel, I immediately recognized Jesus and went quickly to get my brother Peter. Jesus told us that we could stop fishing for fish, and from then on, people would be our business. Jesus must have seen something of value in me because he called me one of the twelve. I have been close to the master ever since. The others, they called me the burner because it seems like my main contribution to the cause was bringing people to Jesus. My brother Peter, the lad with the five loaves and the two fish, and the Greeks who were seeking their master. I guess that's what he saw of value in me, what the others overlooked. Oh, Peter's relationship with Jesus eclipsed mine from the very beginning. But I took some pride in knowing that I was the one that introduced them. And I've been a friend and a companion to our Lord. What greater gift would he afford a fisherman? So how could I be moved to betray this one for whom I left everything? That's unthinkable. Andrew the bringer, would I? Am I the one, Lord? I'm the other James, James the Greater, <laughs> only a matter of height, I assure you. One day, almost three years ago, my brother John and I were in our fishing boat mending nets with our father Zebedee when we first met Jesus. He called out to us, and for some reason we were moved to answer his call. At the time, I really didn't know why. Later, it became more clear. I was with Jesus when he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and I was with him when he healed the daughter of a synagogue leader. And I was with Jesus, my brother, and Peter on top of a high mountain to see heaven peeled open as he was transfigured before our very eyes. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became a dazzling white. Then a bright cloud enveloped us, and a voice said, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It was on that mountain that it became clear to us who Jesus really is. Jesus called John and me sons of thunder. It wasn't really a compliment, but a reference to our fiery nature. Once in a Samaritan village, the people did not welcome Jesus. John and I were furious and shouted, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them, even as Elijah did? But Jesus turned and quietly rebuked us, as only he can do. Jesus taught us that God's way is always one of love. And now, he who taught us the way to love will be betrayed by one whom he loves. One of us will betray him? Him! whom heaven honors as its only son. Why would one of us do such a thing? Yet, deep down inside my own heart, I keep struggling. Is it I? Lord, is it I? Imagination was never my strength. Some call me Thomas the skeptic, the doubter. I'd rather say that I am a realist. I demand proof before I believe. During the meal, Jesus was talking about dying, saying that he would be leaving us soon, but it wouldn't be forever. He said he'd get things ready for us as soon as he got to where he was going. He said that because we knew the way to where he was going, when our time came, we'd all be together again. 
Well, that just made no sense to me. Jesus always talked in riddles. Understanding him sometimes was difficult. Everyone else was quiet, but not me. Actually, I said to Jesus, I have no idea where you are going, and so I have no idea how to get there. After a moment, Jesus replied, I am the way. Though that hardly answered my question, I knew enough to let it go. Jesus was clearly preoccupied, and I would have to wait for a more definitive answer later. As for one of us betraying him, probably just more riddles. It couldn't be me, could it? Ah, uh, I doubt it. Or maybe, am I the one? I, John, was there too, on that mountaintop and at that meal. My heart broke when I heard Jesus say that one of us would betray him. One of us? I love Jesus. I was young when he called my brother James and me, and he was especially careful for me. He welcomed me not only into his group of disciples, but into his family. He calls me the beloved disciple, and I loved him because he loved me. But I knew there was more to Jesus than that. When God wanted to say what God was all about, God spoke. But it wasn't a sound that emerged, but a man, and his name is Jesus. He is the Word of God translated into flesh. In my heart, I knew who Jesus was, and I knew that everyone else could come to know him too, if they kept their hearts open. Yet, he just said that one of us was a betrayer. How could someone betray him who is God's word for the world? Desert him? <laughs> Never. But if he said it, then it must be true. So, is it I? Is it I, Lord? I was not among the first to follow him. Most of the others moved in different social circles than I. Actually, I didn't really have a social circle. Like Zacchaeus, I am a tax collector. I had more money than the fishermen and the farmers, but was considerably less respected. I am Matthew. Jesus did not help his reputation by associating with my colleagues and me. You must understand that tax collecting was just my job. I love the Torah and I have studied the scriptures carefully. I am convinced that Jesus is the fulfilling of the Torah's prophecy. He was the same Messiah, the same Christ, the same anointed of the Lord for whom Israel had waited for centuries. Jesus brought a new gospel, news for all the world. Now, he has just spoken bad news, that one of us will betray him. Who could it be? Will they suspect me because once I was a hated tax collector? Do I suspect myself? Am I the one? Lord, is it I? I am a sinful man. I have more than my share of less than desirable characteristics. I'm impulsive and stubborn, hot-headed, but I am reliable and steady. Maybe that's why he called me Peter, the rock. My brother Andrew and I were fishing in the Sea of Galilee one afternoon when Jesus walked by and said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We immediately left our nets and followed him. But it seemed that I could never get it right, no matter how hard I tried. One day, 
Jesus would call me blessed. Another day told me to get thee behind me, Satan. I tried walking on water. I sank. sank. I suggested we should forgive someone seven times. I thought that was generous. Jesus comes back with some ridiculous number. Jesus seemed to see potential in me, but I always fell short. I just wanted to get it right. Most of them think I'm brash, loud, impulsive, and rude. And they may be right. But betray him? He warned me that before the cock would crow twice, I would deny him three times. Will I? And if I do, what will he do? Will he close the doors of the kingdom to me? Was he referring to me when he said, One of you will betray me? Oh, if I could figure out who the scoundrel is, I would pierce his heart with a knife. But maybe it would be my own heart that I should pierce. God, grant it that it may not be so. No, this time I'm getting it right. Right? Or is it I, Lord? Is it? Nothing of me is likely to be remembered but my name, Simon. My name and the fact that I have been a member of a group which, for our enthusiasm, our commitment, was called Zealots. Perhaps we deserve the reputation of being hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries armed for rebellion against Rome. Yet Jesus told us of the kingdom of the human heart where God reigns supremely. It was a message I longed to hear. He called me, and I surrendered myself to him and was set free. However, my presence in his company and at this table did nothing to soothe the controversy and fear around Jesus' growing fame. If you asked them, the others would probably proclaim their suspicions that I, the zealot, would be the betrayer. But what about the tax collector? The big fisherman? Or does he suspect me, since I am the only former zealot among us? I wonder. Lord, is it I? I am Thaddeus, one of the twelve. As there were twelve tribes of Israel, the foundation of the old Jewish kingdom, Jesus chose 12 of us to be the cornerstones of the new kingdom. I remember how he called us to him and gave us authority over unclean spirits and the power to heal every kind of disease and infirmity. Me, a healer. I remember when he commissioned us to go forth to move into the world and preach about the new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. But before we left, he cautioned us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, because he was sending us out as sheep in the middle of wolves. He often spoke like that. And I remember when we were in Jerusalem and he gave the great invitation, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And now... He who came to share men's burdens has a heavy burden forced upon him, the knowledge that one of us will betray him. But which one of us could it be? The man we least suspect, I'll bet. Or will all of us betray him? Could it be Philip? No. Judas? No. Peter? Nah. Wait. Thaddeus, could it be me? Am I the one, Lord? Is it I?
All the others came from Galilee. My home is in Judea, in the village of Kerioth. So I am known as Judas of Kerioth, or Judas Iscariot. Of the twelve, I was chosen to be the treasurer. To be honest, I was surprised that Jesus even called me to be a part of his group, for he knows what is going on in my heart. I think now he was referring to me when he once said, I have chosen twelve of you, and one of you is a devil. My story is not simple. My motives are not pure, neither purely good nor purely evil. I am as human as any of you. Money and power, even a few pieces of silver, become easier explanations than less convenient, more com complicated truths. In truth, we have waited long enough. We need to move. Jesus refuses to act. He responds to no argument. He must be forced into the open. Then the world will know that he is who he claims to be, the Messiah, the King of Israel. And now, this king says that one of us will betray him? Do not call this betrayal. Honestly, I do not think the others will, sus will suspect me. More of them will suspect Simon the Zealot, or Matthew the tax collector, or those fishermen. For I was chosen to carry the purse. Everyone else is saying, am I the one? Well, And what happened to my 12 apostles? Some of what you believe is historical fact, and some is tradition and legend. But I know their message has continued to move people, even in your own present day. Nathaniel was faithful to the continued preaching of my message, and took a copy of Matthew's Gospel into India and part of what is now Russia. He was martyred for preaching and zealously sharing his faith. James the Younger also fell at the hands of his enemies and became a martyr by stoning. Some of his bones and relics are preserved to this day, buried under the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople. Andrew became a productive evangelist and missionary, sharing his gospel in Scythia, which is southern Russia around the Black Sea. His ministry also included Greece and Ephesus. On November 30 and 69 AD, he was crucified on a cross shaped like an X. Philip also became an active missionary, spreading his gospel to Scythia where he preached for 20 years. He traveled to Heropolis in Phrygia where priests of the pagan gods placed him on a cross and stoned him to death. He died praying for his enemies and tormentors as I did. John, the disciple whom I loved, took the responsibility of caring for my mother Mary until her death. As with his fellow disciples, John's life was filled with persecution. To stop his preaching, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. It is there that God gave John the revelation. John the revelation. John is responsible for five books of the New Testament. John died in Ephesus around 100 AD. He was the last of the apostles to die, and he was the only apostle to die a natural. Thomas, the apostle accused of having doubt, went on to become one of the most fruitful of all the apostles. He traveled to Babylon and established churches there. Then he went on to India, to a town now a suburb of Madras, where he preached for 20 years. Multitudes were, converted, were converted. To this day, the work of Thomas is carried out in India. Thomas was martyred by a lance thrust through him. He was buried in Mayulapon, India. <laughs> yes, Peter. He, as well as all the disciples, denied me, but was repentant. He became a bold and prolific evangelist. On the day of Pentecost, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, became a spokesman and preached the gospel. 
thousands were saved. Later he journeyed to later he journeyed to Lydda, Joppa, and even into what is now Great Britain. He was martyred on Vatican Hill in Rome by Nero. He was crucified upside down because Peter felt he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as I. He is entombed in Vatican, entombed in Vatican City under the basilica that bears his name. James, the son of Zebedee, of whom I said, Indeed, you will drink of the same cup that I drink of, became the first apostle to be martyred. He was beheaded by King Herod Agrippa in 44 AD. Before his death, he was a dedicated minister of the gospel, taking the gospel, taking the message to many places, including Spain. Some of his bones are entombed in Jerusalem, and others were taken to Spain, where they remain today. Simon the Zealot spread the gospel into Egypt, Cyrene, Africa, and then to Great Britain. He too became a martyr when he was crucified in Great Britain. Matthew wrote the gospel that opens the New Testament. He spent most of his life ministering to the Hebrews in Palestine. From there he traveled to Ethiopia, northern Greece, Syria, and Persia, where he was martyred for his faithfulness in serving me. Matthew's body is buried in the cathedral in Salerno, Italy. Thaddeus was a faithful follower of mine. He took my gospel message into Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, and Persia. He was martyred in Syria. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, God's new covenant poured out for many people for the forgiveness of sins. After learning that I was to be crucified, Judas Iscariot attempted to return the money he had been paid for his betrayal. Overcome with remorse, he took his own life. My friends, children, I am with you for only a short time longer. You are going to look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Let me give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let us now pray the prayer that our Lord himself has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human. Scorned by others and despised by the people, all who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me, they divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away, O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. <laughs> 